Hello and um, welcome to the very first lecture of uh, Compilers, Introduction to Translation and Compiling, CS468. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about introduction um, and then we're going to cover what a compiler is, why do we craft a compiler and the different types of compilers and we're going to talk a little bit about interpreters because there is a kind of relation between compilers and interpreters that you're going to see uh, in this lecture. Uh, compilers is actually um, a way of engineering that would allow you to simplify problems and uh, make them possible to be solved. Without compilers, we wouldn't have been able to have all this kind of technology that we have right now. Uh, simply because having a compiler gives you the ability and the capability to write code in a much higher language. Before compilers, um, we uh, used, um, in the very first beginning, punched cards, as you will see in this lecture, and... Uh, that was a terrible process and a very long, terrible process in order for you to be able to have a program that runs. <clears throat> um, and then the assembly language appeared and uh, that was a big step ahead. However, <clears throat> using uh, assembly language is not the easiest, as we all know by now. Uh, simply because in order for you to do certain simple task, it requires a lot of coding in assembly, uh, basically because assembly maps almost one to one with the machine language. So you need to write a lot of, a lot of code um, involving uh, data movements from memory to registers and handling interrupts and so on and so forth in order for you to be able uh, to do a very simple task that you actually do today using any high level language. Uh, and that's why the compilers made it actually possible to create extremely sophisticated software that wasn't even possible to create um, using a simply language mind you, the punched cards. <clears throat> and because of compilers, you can now have software in uh, so many fields, uh, the whole spectrum, starting from banking, medical, manufacturing, government application, uh, automation, aviation, um, probably uh, all fields of industry uh, have dedicated software for them, thanks to compilers. So what is a compiler? <clears throat> a compiler is nothing but a translator that translates source code into certain form of an output. Um, this form of an output is an executable program. It doesn't have to be an executable program, of course, but most probably it is an executable program. You do have other compilers that do not reach uh, the level of execution and it gives you an output um, in a different form that requires uh, an executor, just like Java as an example. Java C is a compiler that produces a class file and the class file is not really an executable file by, by, by itself but it needs a certain software to run it with Java. But in the end of the day, the compiler is nothing but a translator that translates source code in the form of a high-level language closer to the human mind, uh, hopefully closer to the English language. At least that was the purpose when uh, the first compiler was created, to have a language that is closer to the English language. And the compiler translates what you write into um, a language, a form that is close to the machine language. So it elevates all the burden and the complexity and the uh, hideous job uh, 
that you need to do uh, if you require to write the code uh, directly using this uh, machine language. So because the compiler is a translator, we can actually see the compiler is nothing but a transfer function. It's a, it's a function um, um, that has an input and gives you an output. So according to this function that is written, you have the alpha, uh, alif, alif uh, equals epsi, uh, and the input is phi. So the epsi uh, is the translation behavior of the compiler, as you will see in this lecture. And you give it the phi, which is basically the source code that you get, and the output would be the alif, which is uh, the target code. And the target code could be, as I said before, either a machine language or any other type of target code that the compiler is designed for, something like Java as an example, the class file. So uh, before creating compilers, we had uh, punched cards. That's how we started actually computing. And uh, the way we wrote programs is really uh, punching those kind of cards to create holes and non-holes. The hole is equivalent to either one or zero, and the the other one is, you know, the opposite. And um, this way, uh, you are actually writing your program in a form of a one-zero in a card that is being read by the machine. The, this is a hideous job first to create the uh, card itself, and second, um, if you have a problem with your code, then you need to really punch all these uh, cards again. Um, uh, while writing this program, you could end up having many, many cards, like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cards to perform a very simple task. Uh, imagine if you have one hole that is not punched right, this means that you need to repunch everything else, right? Um, after the punched cards, we finally had the assembler. And back then, the assembler was a huge move that elevated the burden of punching the cards and having uh, a program that is written. And that was a big step ahead. Um, the problem with assembly language in general is that it maps one-to-one -to, -one to machine language, almost one-to-one. -one. The difference is that instead of writing your code in a one-zero fashion, you actually write the code in a language that can be read by the programmer, just like the assembly language you learn nowadays. Um, it's a big step ahead comparing to what it used to be, but it's still a lot of work in order to be able to do something that is meaningful. Um, in order for you to be able to write a program that performs something um, useful, something uh, complex enough, uh, to be used in uh, nowadays technology. Um, if you want to do it in assembly, it would take you years to write this kind of program. Simply because a single high-level language can be translated to thousands of assembly instructions. <clears throat> um, and that's why even though the assembly with a big step ahead, it's not the answer to actually be able to achieve uh, complex systems, complex software uh, that would actually um, satisfy the need of the industry. Um, the problem also with the assemblers is that they are very bound to the hardware architecture and that's why um, you probably have seen it in uh, earlier courses that if you're working with a CISC architecture as an example you have a kind of assembly that suits the Cisco architecture and the registers in the architecture and so on and so forth. 
And if you're using RISC architecture, it has a totally different uh, assembly language that has uh, its own set of uh, registers and own uh, set of instructions how to load from memory, how to store, and so on and so forth. A complete different set of assembly instructions. Um, which makes the assembly language very bound to the hardware that you are actually, you're actually using. Um, which means that if you write a program in assembly for a Cisco architecture and now you decide to run the program in a RISC architecture, this means you will actually need to rewrite the program again from the very first beginning. Um, the assembler process has um, a few passes, so to say. What is a pass? A pass is a scanning a program. It's going through the program and performing s some kind of um, task to get closer to the execution image. <clears throat> uh, so the assembler works in two passes, and uh, uh, pass one uh, goes through the program, uh, defines the symbols that exist in the program, and uh, puts it in what we call symbol table, as you would see in this course. And pass two reads from the symbol table and try to manifest and um, build the executable image of your code. Uh, it's not really a hard process because, as I said before, a simple language almost maps one to one to the um, machine language. So it doesn't really require much of transformation. Um, the assembler only made it possible for the uh, uh, programmer to write and read programs that are readable by a human instead of reading ones and zeros, <clears throat> which is a hideous task to do. And then the dawn of the high-level languages. Um, After a while of you know using the assembly language, people realize that this is not the solution because the need and the dependency on computer systems um, was increasing rapidly, and um, this means more sophisticated software and more uh, complex systems to be uh, designed and implemented, and that's why. The assembly language were no longer the answer. <clears throat> and that's why mathematicians and software engineers tried to find a solution for this. And the solution was to build a translator. They called it before, after this compiler for a reason, and uh, I'll mention this later. And this translator translates a higher level language. Uh, with more capabilities and more readability than the assembly language into an executable. So the whole idea uh, behind compiler is to be able to write code that is closer to the human mind rather than close to the um, machine architecture. <clears throat> uh, the very first compiler that was crafted, uh, it was for a language called Fortran and Fortran is used to be very very famous in the 60s and uh, Fortran uh, abbreviates formula translation and from the name you can actually uh, expect that this this kind of language is for scientific purposes right it, it tries formulas it solves equations and so on it's called uh, formula translation uh, and that was the very first attempt uh, to create a compiler. And it was, uh, for the very first time, possible for developers to write code that is virtually independent of the machine code. Because using assembly was all machine dependent. And after creating the compiler of the Fortran, that it became now possible to write code that is independent of that machine uh, architecture. You don't have to take the architecture into consideration. You don't deal with 
registers and memory locations instead of this you actually deal with variables and you know that the the image of the higher level language that we use uh, now <clears throat> uh, the, the good thing about compilers that uh, you can actually translate your code into different architectures so this made the language itself independent of the architecture yes you would need different compilers for different architectures but you don't need a different language for a different architecture like the case of sysc and risk right uh, the assembly language itself of sysc is totally different from the assembly language of risk uh, that's not the case anymore after creating the compiler because the exact same language can be translated to architecture A and can be translated to architecture B if we have a translator that translates to A and another translator that translates to B. Uh, <clears throat> so this is how we build a compiler. The compiler is not really a trivial uh, task. Like, as you see, uh, as an example, if you're using GCC, uh, you just use the GCC and give it the, the uh, C file, and uh, all of a sudden you find the executable file created if there's no errors, and uh, you can run the executable, right? Um, it's a one-line call for the compiler to perform this. And if you're using something like Visual Studio, it's just a button click. But there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes. It's not that simple. Um, what you see here um, are the stages uh, that takes the source code, the program, from being a source code into being an executable. So, uh, as you can see here, the first stage is called a scanner, scanning. And uh, what is scanning? Scanning is basically getting the source code and identifying the parts that exist in this source code. So you divide your program into what we call tokens. Every token is a separate entity by itself. And uh, this token, the, the tokens in general together are the building blocks of this source code. And then after you divide your program into a stream of tokens, like you, you convert, you translate your source code into a stream of tokens, now you, you need to make sense of those tokens. You need to understand those tokens, what, what they mean. And that's what we call parsing and, and basically parsing is a process that um, defines the meaning of your tokens and the relationships between tokens and each other because um, the, the relationship between those kind of tokens will dictate how you're going to execute this code and will dictate the meaning of your statement and then you go for semantic routines, um, uh, which uh, basically, for now, well, let's say um, uh, it means to have uh, the, the semantic of your code. Semantic means the meaning. There's a syntax and there's a semantic. So you, you identify the semantic of the whole code, and you identify the routines and the functions and so on. By this step, you already have an intermediate representation of your code. So the code now uh, has been converted from a high-level source code into an intermediate representation, as you, as you will see in this course. Uh, this intermediate representation uh, is not optimized, as you will see. So you actually need to optimize it in order to have an optimal code representation. So you eliminate uh, 
repetitions. You eliminate unnecessary variables. You eliminate some uh, unnecessary code. So that the remaining code is the required code to perform the task that is defined by your source program. And this step is the optimizer. After you optimize your code, you're now ready to generate your machine language. Um, it's worth saying here uh, uh, that uh, if, if you look at those stages, <clears throat> you probably, if you need to uh, have different compilers for different machine architectures, it makes total sense that the, the, the step that would be different from a compiler to another is actually the code generation one. Because this is the mapping function that maps what you have optimized to the code that will be generated. Right? So you, you generate your code as certain target machine. Of course, I mean, the target machine could dictate the design and the definition of earlier stages, but the code generation is the bulk that needs to change when you're talking from, you know, uh, you're saying uh, Windows versus Linux, uh, RISC versus CISC, and so on and so forth. Operating system changes, architecture changes, whatever that is, you need different compilers. The good news is you don't need to rewrite the whole compiler again. The scanner is the same, the parser is the same, the semantic routines are the same. Probably the optimization will change a little bit depending on the nature of the operating system and the architecture, and the code generator will need to change to define the uh, target machine code you have. The uh, symbol and attribute table that you see in the middle, um, this is an entity that is required and touched probably by most of those stages. And it's, the, it's a table, it's a lookup table that defines your variables and defines uh, your objects that you define in your program. So it tells you this variable exists in this location and uh, uh, this pointer points to this location and so on and so forth. So whatever variables that are not included in uh, the language, you will find it in the symbol table as you will see probably in chapter 6. <clears throat> Uh, we'll go back to those stages and uh, probably uh, get deeper, each and every one of them. So for the scanner, uh, the scanner begins the analysis of the source, source program by reading the input character by character. It's a sequential machine, as you will see. We always do it as a finite automata. Um, so finite set automata, as you know, is sequential, and that's why it takes it as a character by character. And then it groups those characters and uh, builds what we call tokens. And the token is a word, it's a symbol, it's a variable, it's something that has a meaning. It's the building block of your program. The scanner could be a regular expression, it could be a uh, finite state automata, whether it's non-deterministic or deterministic, you will study all this throughout this uh, course and you will learn Lex. And Lex is one of the programming languages that you can use to build scanners. Uh, so the token is a string of characters, as I said, that has a meaning. A token is a syntactic category that forms a class. And the lexem is a string of characters that is the lowest level syntactic unit in the programming language, a variable, a uh, for loop, uh, uh, if statement, and so on and so forth. Um, so the C programming language, as an example, um, the tokens are classified into six categories. You have keywords, you have identifiers, you have constants, you have strings, you have special symbols, you have operators. If you know uh, C programming, and I know all of you do, uh, you will know what I'm talking about here.
Uh, and then the second step is the parsing. And the parsing, um, it gives a formal syntax specification. Uh, <clears throat> usually it's in the form of a context-free grammar. Uh, you will know what a context-free grammar is and you will know the difference between what we call context-free grammar and uh, regular grammar. Um, probably uh, in two lectures from now. Um, uh, anyhow, it takes the tokens and the groups and then um, it generates uh, productions and from those productions it actually uh, it takes according to our produ production is a rule so it applies the production from the input set of tokens or group of tokens and produces something else as you will see throughout this course <clears throat> uh, when the syntactic structure is recognized the parser either calls corresponding semantic routines directly or builds a syntax tree uh, which leads us to the meaning of semantic routine. So uh, if you know this code is a for loop, you will call something for the for loop. Um, if you know it's an if statement, you will call something for the if statement, and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of translation. Uh, there are many, many ways to do the parsing. Uh, you can do CFG, which is context-free grammar. You can do BNF, GAA, LL, LR. Um, we'll, we're, in this course, we're um, basically interested in the LL, LL1. You know what that means. And the context-free grammar. And we'll touch also the regular grammar in, uh, in deep, actually, because it's, this is the base of everything else. And you will learn another programming language, it's called Yak. And uh, trust me, it's not as bad as the name uh, sounds. It's a really interesting language that you can use to build parsers. Uh, and then uh, the semantic routines, which you check the static semantic of each construct and you translate it to what, what it actually means. And the semantic routines is, according to the book, it's the heart of the compiler. Um, I would say the, the uh, scanner and the parser are also the heart of the compiler. So those three stages are the compiler itself. The other two stages are uh, not mandatory. So you don't need to optimize, you can have code that is not optimized and it's still going to work and the go code generation uh, is something necessary but it's not the heart of the compiler uh, and then the optimization uh, the optimization is um, you take the output code from the semantic routine and then you optimize it and by optimizing it mean it means that if you uh, <clears throat> have code that is not necessary to be included, then you just throw it away as if it doesn't exist, uh, as you will see uh, in an example uh, shortly. And then you generate the code uh, uh, as an output of the target uh, machine code that is required, and this is really dictated by the operating system you're using and the architecture you are uh, crafting the compiler for. Those are the stages that allow you to build a compiler. Um, those are defined stages and throughout this semester we will learn all those stages from beginning to end. So if you have this statement position equal initial plus rate equal 60. When you use the scanner you will tokenize this kind of uh, statement and you will have something like this id1 equals id2 id3 and equals 60. And uh, id1, id2, id3 are being added to the symbol table which is position initial 
and great. And then you're going to parse it. And the parser will get you something like this. A parse tree. And the parse tree, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, it defines the logical relationship between those kind of tokens. So it says that the ID1 equals whatever is going to be calculated from what is following. And then ID2 is being added to the multiplication of ID3 and 60. Right? This parse tree is the definition of the statement. It, it actually explains how this statement should be executed to get the right answer. And then you get the semantic uh, tree, um, um, uh, sorry, process. And uh, throughout the semantic process, you will generate an abstract syntax tree. You will learn all about it. Uh, and by, uh, by the way, here it's called the decorated tree as well. Uh, you will know why. And then uh, you perform code generation. <clears throat> and this code generation, as you, you can see, is different from how you wrote it. So uh, the one statement in the higher level language uh, is being uh, transferred into four different statements in the intermediate representation. Uh, bear in mind that this in, um, intermediate representation is not optimized. So you need to optimize it, which would give you this kind of code. <clears throat> uh, so if, if you see here, um, the first two steps weren't really needed and the last two steps weren't really needed as two so you could you could have joined step one and two instead of changing uh integer to real the 60 and then get temp one and add it to id3 you could have just said that temp one equal id3 multiplied by 60.0 which is the real value of 60. and um same with the uh, ID1. Instead of saying you can create temp3 and then assign it to ID1, now you can say ID1 equal ID2 plus temp1 directly. So you optimize your code from having four intermediate instructions into just two. So the question is, why did we generate four from the very first beginning? Well, that's a good question. Because this four instructions is a one-to-one -one translation to this tree. Uh, if you look at this, um, the abstract syntax tree that you got, you do have four different operations. The first one is to change the 60 into real. And then the result of this one, you um, add it, sorry, multiply it, by the this token the id <clears throat> id3 and the result you will add it to id2 and the result you will assign it to id1 that's what the abstract syntax tree says and that's why you generated four uh, intermediate statements <clears throat> not optimized absolutely not and that's why we have the code optimizer that actually eliminates reduce the number of statements generated from four to two and then after optimization you generate the code as you can see uh, in this particular example it generates uh, something like a simply code as you can see in the uh, in this example it doesn't have to be a simply code it could be directly a machine language it could be uh, a class like java uh, whatever that is uh, it's defined by the requirement before you build your compiler. So uh, now let's talk about different types of compilers. <clears throat> uh, you have a few different types of compilers. We say pure machine code. You have augmented machine code and virtual machine code. The pure machine code, it generates code that is 
self-sufficient and complete. And the program doesn't need any service or routine from other external sources. What does this mean? It's as simple as this. When the pure code generation means that your code that has been generated does not call any service from the operating system. It does not. It's actually self-sufficient. So all the functionalities, all the services, all the codes that is required for this program to run are embedded inside your code. So there is no external calls. There is no external dependency over the operating system that this uh, code is using. Uh, <clears throat> is it good? Well, uh, it's fast for sure because it doesn't need any uh, waiting time for a service call. Uh, the disadvantage of this approach, though, is that um, your program is huge, size-wise. Why? Because uh, it has everything in it, and it doesn't reuse what has been already made in the operating systems and so on and so forth. So it's actually, again, it's the concept of modularity and uh, uh, reusability, which are two important concepts in uh, computer science and computer engineering. Uh, because you embed everything without the, the uh, dependency on any calls, it's very expected that the code that you generate is very machine-specific. Because the code that has been generated is very tailored to your machine. That the architecture of the machine, uh, uh, how the machine looks like, and so on and so forth. Uh, and since it's a very machine-specific, it has limited portability. Portability means you can uh, compile it for some machine and you run it in another. It's a machine-specific. So definitely has limited to no portability. And the code generation is definitely much faster since there is no external calls. Of course, that's one of the advantages. But the program is huge, big, and slow. Uh, uh, the augmented code is the way to go here. Um, most compilers are augmented, and the idea behind aug uh, augmented code is that uh, that the uh, generated code uses the services that are uh, is provided by the operating system. So, if you have an operating system that provides certain libraries, certain uh, uh, services, uh, and instead of regenerating this kind of code inside your program, what you do is you perform a call, a call to the operating system. Uh, and then the operating system does the service for you and returns back with the results to your uh, program. Um, now, the generation of this target code is definitely easier. Why? Because you don't have to generate everything. You just need to uh, perform calls whenever needed. Uh, and it supports the modularity, definitely, and the reuse of the, of the code. Um, but it's slower than uh, the pure one. Why? Because, as I said, the pure one is fast because it doesn't wait to, to call. It doesn't wait uh, uh, for the operating system to reply a call and get a result back. Um, now, for the augmented, the code will wait. So the code will requ require the service and then it will wait for the operating system to answer. Which means that the execution of um, 
the uh, augmented ones uh, is definitely slower but it's also cheaper why would it be cheaper it's cheaper because you don't need to spend so many hours uh, doing um, um, uh, what is needed to be done for the other kind of compilers so it's cheaper to uh, create an augmented machine code than the pure one the virtual machine <clears throat> um, the biggest example of it is Java as an example um, so for the virtual machine you have something uh, that def defines its own architecture and what is required here is that you the compiler will produce the code that matches the virtual machine architecture here is an example of uh, uh, Java virtual machine one of the most famous virtual machines ever the good thing about the virtual machines is the portability so if you have a JVM which is the Java virtual machine you can have it run on Mac, you can have it run on Linux, you can have it run in Windows, um, and the code is the same, <clears throat> which is beautiful. Um, now, the target code, the assembly language, as, a, as a one of the target codes, it simplifies the design and implementation of the compiler. Why? Because we already have an assembly. <clears throat> And the, um, the task of the assembler is to translate a simply language into machine code. So if your target code is actually assembly, then you actually elevated the burden of generating the machine code and you're using the capability of the assembler. So you're gonna stop at the assembly level and then use the assembler that has been used for long to generate the machine code uh, from the um, assembly language you generated. Um, it's very important here to note that uh, the parts of the compilers in general, whether it's scanners, whether it's parsers, whether it's uh, uh, target generators, they're all translators, by the way. You can see it this way. Each and every step of those are translators. Um, they differ from uh, what they're translating and how they translate. So, uh, scanners as an exa example, it takes a high-level language as an English language and translates it into tokens. Right? Where parsing takes the tokens and translates it into uh, parse tree and so on and so forth. But in the end of the day, all of them are translators. Uh, Another uh, target code is the relocatable binary. Uh, and relocatable means that the binary doesn't have a fixed set of addresses. And you will study this uh, uh, in details if, you, if you're going to study uh, operating systems. If not, then uh, you would know that uh, loading the program into the memory requires uh, a memory space. So the, the question here, is this memory space fixed or is it relocatable? Is it, can it vary from a run to another? <clears throat> um, if you, if you look, read through these relocatable binaries, um, uh, most of the operating systems, oh, sorry, uh, the uh, compilers we have, they do uh, relocatable binaries. Uh, it makes actually the job of the operating system easier because uh, then the operating system can load the program and uh, put it in any page frames available. It doesn't have to relocate it in certain and specific places. The absolute binary, which is a memory image, is different. It has fixed it of uh, uh, memory, memory space and address space, which cause the thing to be a little bit harder. 
Now we need to talk about the interpreters a little bit. Uh, interpreters and compilers are both translators. So what is the big difference? What is the big deal here? The compilers take they take the uh, the input stream uh, as a source file and then generate the execution. So actually the, the, the execution you have is first generated fully and then you can run it later. So you can say that the compilation is an offline process because it doesn't happen on the fly. You actually compile first and then after compiling you take the uh, output of this compile and then run it. The interpretation is different. The interpretation you actually interpret your program statement by statement. Um, so uh, it works online, it reads and it executes as it reads. Um, uh, there are languages that support this, like Lisp, one of the uh, very important um, mathematics uh, languages. Lisp is uh, Lisp uh, processing, the, it abbreviates Lisp processing. It's a recursive language, it's a, a functional paradigm, functional paradigm. Uh, uh, what, what you have learned in C, C++, uh, Java and all this is called imperative paradigm. Why? Because you tell the program what to do and it follows your lead. In the functional paradigm, however, it doesn't work this way. In the functional paradigm, instead of telling the computer what to do, you actually explain the program, the problem, and then the 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 uh, the program figures out how to solve the program uh, that the problem has. Uh, how you um, described it um, because because the execution of the program goes on the fly they definitely need less amount of time to analyze the source code why because they do it step by step right uh, there is no intermediate object uh, generation uh, which means uh, the memory is efficient uh, but um, I, I can tell you that because the interpretation here is happening on uh, a statement base, then you cannot really optimize your code, right? So you can generate an optimal code for what you wrote. Why? Because the program is being read line by line. So the relationships and the optimization between lines cannot really happen. So in this lecture we have seen um, uh, what the compilers are. As I said, they're nothing but translators. Uh, we have seen why um, um, we need a compiler, we need to craft a compiler, and we have seen uh, what an assembler is, and we know now that the assembly language and the machine language, they map one to one. Um, and then we have seen how the uh, high-level language uh, started to appear, they started to appear through the Fortran. And then we have uh, gone through the stages of compiling one by one, and uh, uh, those kind of stages are what we're going to go deep inside throughout this semester. Um, I hope you uh, actually uh, understood this lecture. If you have any questions, please send me an email, and uh, uh, we're going to discuss this um, in the next lecture.